Yesterday I finished reading a book that I am already looking forward to rereading. It is by a scholar, Nuccio Urbine, who is Professor of Literature at the University of Calabria. A brief summation which masks a long and distinguished career. He is the world's foremost authority on the Renaissance thinker and scientist Giordano Bruno, and he has taught at Yale, at NYU, the Sorbonne, the Warburg Institute and Louvain. In 2011, Ordine was given a copy of an essay by Abraham Flexner called The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Flexner, born in 1866, was an educator, a self-made man, the first in his family to go to university. He completed a classics degree, returned to Louisville, where he set up a school to test his own ideas about education, and succeeded so well that he was able to pay for his brother to take a medical degree at Johns Hopkins and his sister's undergraduate degree at Bryn Mawr. Between 1908 and 1939, Flexner was instrumental in extensively reshaping both medical and higher education in the US. And then he was heavily involved in bringing over numerous scientists, mainly Jewish, from Nazi Germany to the safety of the US, including Einstein. Ordine read Flaxner's spirited defence of funding men and women to think without expectation of any concrete income or outcome. Ordine was inspired to write this book, A 21st Century Defence, against the monetization of education and thereby knowledge. He covers, in short, perceptive chapters, an immense amount of ground, gathering his evidence from sources as diverse as Dante, Petrarch, quoted here, and Robert Louis Stevenson. Here we see Jim Hawkins exploring the vast bounty, the huge variety of coins that comprise the treasure stored on Treasure Island, and sees the coins not as material wealth, but as a record of sovereigns of Europe and symbols of strange cultures, as Stevenson says, as autumn leaves, harbingers of death and desiccation. My favourite chapter, I think, was the one in which Ordinaire unpicks the mysteries of Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice focusing in particular on Bassanio's choice of the lead casket in the hope that it will win him Portia's hand in marriage, a symbol of this impoverished humanist's ability to see beyond surface glister. Ordinaire, of course, explores the great classical thinkers, Plato, Socrates and Aristotle, in relation to their quests for freedom, wisdom, and virtue, and we will come back a little later to Socrates. It may be that I love this book particularly because Ordine quotes three of my favourite writers who still provide solace. Michel de Montaigne, whose essays are at once an exploration that he himself calls useless, and the wisest, richest store of reflection and comfort yet written. Uh, this is an image of his study, which is one of my favourite shrines. Then there is Ionesco, whose play Rhinoceros exploded into my life when I was 16 and still resonates. Forms of rhinoceritis of every kind, from left and right, are there to threaten humanity when men have no time to think or collect themselves. And of course... Ordine, being Italian, reflects on Calvino, whose books The Baron in the Trees and If on a Winter's Night a Traveller continue to remind us of the joys of reading and learning. Here, Ordine quotes Calvino saying, often the commitment that men invest in activities that seem totally gratuitous, with no other aim in mind except enjoyment, 
or the satisfaction of solving a difficult problem turns out to be essential in an area that nobody has foreseen and has far-reaching consequences. This is true for poetry and art, just as it is for science and technology. The first section of the book allowed me to revisit these old friends, but the second part went to the heart of something that has preoccupied me since I started studying educational leadership and management about 15 years ago, namely the terrible impact of reductive economic imperatives driving educational policy and organisation. It is no comfort to find Ordine quoting at length from Victor Hugo's speech to France's Constitutional Assembly in November 1848, challenging the reduction in budget which France's politicians were proposing for universities, museums and libraries. 170 years on, the same impulses reign. Ordine rightly challenges the way that marketization and monetization in universities, and sadly, in my experience in schools, has led to two disturbing trends. The dumbing down of courses to make it easier for students to pass exams, and on what Ordine calls the heavy stress on professionalization, or students taking only those courses which it is believed will open doors to well-paid jobs. These limitations prevent us from becoming the best we can be. Like Hamlet, our dreams prevent us from ruling infinite space. But unlike Hamlet, it is because our dreams are petty, trivial, technical. Instead of encouraging us to cultivate our spirit independently and give curiosity free reign, to paraphrase Ordine, we become purely utilitarian, measuring worth by use rather than by beauty or freedom or virtue. Ordine makes a plea for authentic teaching, calling it a form of seduction because the love of the teacher for their subject is what inspires and touches the student. At this time of distance teaching and remote delivery, it is harder than ever for us as teachers and students to love what is difficult and persist in unpicking the mysterious and complex. To sum up, as Ordine does in the third section of his book, Education leads us to dignity, to knowledge, to wisdom, and so to freedom and truth. These are the true outcomes of teaching and learning, <laughs> although in the hurly-burly of school life it is all too easy to forget this. My one criticism of the book is this. Not one woman has a voice. Of course, you can argue that Ordine is looking at the classics at a time when women were limited in their opportunities. But in a book which name checks 19th and 20th century writers, there is surely room for Sappho, for Vittoria Colonna, for George Eliot, for Simone de Beauvoir. Or even for Diotima who so clarified Socrates' investigation into the nature of love, beauty and virtue. Her ladder, a symbol of blending love and wisdom to reach an understanding of the true nature of beauty and virtue, is still a powerful symbol of the benefits of the disinterested sharing of knowledge and the search after it. By failing to acknowledge that the embodiments of wisdom in classical times were women, were goddesses, were Athena and Sophia, Ordine did do me a useful service, reminding me of the writing of another great modern philosopher, Martha Nussbaum. If you haven't read anything by her, Love's Knowledge, Essays on Philosophy and Literature are an excellent place to start. That said... Ordine's book is brilliant. 
timely and worthwhile. Thank you for listening.